Welcome to the Rediscovery channel. This is the channel where every week I, Ivor Kovac, and my good friend Stilgar try to come up with a topic from history that the other guy hasn't heard about. So today it is my turn. And today I actually have a topic from American history. Uh, so I've got to ask uh, Stilgar, have you heard of Andrew Jackson? No, I've never heard of him. Great. But you've seen him before because his face is the one that's on the $20 bill. Okay. Okay. Yep. Mm. So um, probably like our American audience, they've heard of Andrew Jackson already, but hopefully uh, you guys will hear something that you haven't heard before about him. So I'm going to drop a, a couple of facts here really fast. Uh, Andrew Jackson lived from 1767 to 1845 and he was president of the United States from 1829 to 1837 and he was also the seventh president of the United States number seven so uh, Andrew Jackson he lived through the American Revolution um, but he was just a kid at the time and for context uh, the American Revolution it ran from 1775 to 1783 that's, that's how long we were fighting against the English for our independence. Okay, so uh, Andrew Jackson was born on 3-15-1776 in an, in an area called the Waxhaws. And it's an area that kind of overlaps between North and South Carolina. And the, the, like all the sources that I looked at, they said that it's uncertain whether he was actually born in North or South Carolina both states kind of lay claim to him, but uh, Andrew Jackson himself said that he was from South Carolina. Hmm. So, yeah. So during the Revolutionary War, um, Andrew Jackson was uh, a kid. He was too young to be a uh, army regular. And actually his oldest brother, he had two brothers. The oldest one died in combat against the English. And then he and the other brother... They were too young to be soldiers, so they served as messengers during the, um, the Revolutionary War for the army. And they ended up getting captured by the English, and they were put up in this house. And uh, one of the English soldiers, one of the officers, he demanded that Andrew Jackson polish his boots. And Andrew refused. And when he refused, this guy took his sword and slashed him across the face. And uh, like uh, he got a scar across his face and uh, his arm because he, I guess, uh, actually, I think the guy was probably aiming for his head or for his neck. And Andrew Jackson kind of ducked and put up his hand at the same time. And so instead of losing his head, he got a cut across his, uh, his face and his arm. And this is important because Andrew Jackson was very anti-elitist. He didn't like uh, uh, rich people, like very people that were very rich, and he didn't care that much for politicians, even though he ends up becoming very rich and a politician himself. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and so... Well, what, the area he was from was really poor, right? North and South Carolina. Aren't those traditionally really poor areas? Um, so the southern states where they had... Uh, the most slavery, you know, they had the plantation based economy that was mostly worked by you. Yeah, I guess you could say it was mostly poor. Um, there wasn't as much social stratification there as there was in the in the northern states because of slavery. So you had like uh, most of the most of the people in the states were not slaves and most of the people did not own slaves. But most of those people um from that part of the country, the average the average guy would be like a small farmer who would just own like a small patch of land and just kind of subsist off of that. That's what most of the Southerners were doing uh, back okay. then. And, so, and uh, this area that he was from, that's not the same area as uh, the Appalachian area? No, the okay. Appalachians are further to the, uh, the west. Okay. So, um, yeah. no, this is uh, North Carolina and South Carolina. They're coastal states. East okay. Coast. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so actually what ends up happening is that his 
brother gets sick and dies, and then his mother gets sick and dies, and his father died earlier from, I think it was a logging accident. So he's an orphan, and his family is not that, uh, his surviving family at the time is not that uh, fond of him. So after the war, when he's in his late teens, he start he gets into into law. And from what I've seen, he had no college degree and he didn't even uh, graduate high school necessarily, although I could be wrong on that one. Uh, but he, he ends up joining the North Carolina Bar in 1787. And eventually he becomes a prosecutor working in the Western Territory of North Carolina, the Western Annex, which later on would become the state of Tennessee. But back then it was still part of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And he lives with other people while he's there and kind of rents rooms in their houses. And he meets this woman called uh, Rachel Robards. And she's actually married to somebody else, but the guy is abusive. And so Andrew Jackson, he, he, gets involved with her and he actually marries her while she's still in the process of getting a legal divorce from her husband. So uh, they are married or at least they have a marriage ceremony and they're cohabitating before um, the divorce has been legally formalized on paperwork. Um, Mm. Yeah. And he, he opens up his own uh, law practice while he's there. And at this point, he, he starts to accumulate wealth. He starts to become rich. And he buys his first slave. And then he establishes a mansion called the Hermitage, which I'll put a picture of in the slideshow. And he starts building a slave plantation. And he ends up being, um, uh, I think he ends up owning like over 300 slaves, something like that. And... <clears throat> so Tennessee becomes a state in 1796 with the help of Andrew Jackson. Uh, he helps write the Tennessee state constitution. And after that, he says uh, he gets elected to the U.S. House of Representatives to represent Tennessee. But after being there for one year, he gets tired of it. And he says he doesn't like politics and he wants to quit. But then uh, in 1797, he gets elected to the Senate. And again, sent back to Washington, D.C. And again, he doesn't like it. And he comes back after a year. And then he serves as a judge for a while. And in 1802, he's put in charge of the Tennessee militia. And and militia is not the same thing as the United States Army. The militia is like a a state force of regular citizens who also uh, can be called upon to, like, they kind of train together with guns and with uh, formations. And they can be called up. Yeah, for an emergency. And it was more important back then um, because there were Native American raids that would come into the, uh, you know, America was much smaller. It was just along the East Coast. And yeah. Native Americans used to come in kind of like Vikings. Um, and so that, that was part of the reason for having that. Militias were, coming, uh, were common over in Europe as well. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not because of Native Americans, but. Could be because, because of, of pirates or yeah yeah, yeah say yeah. Yeah, pro- yeah you know <clears throat> neighbors in, that you have to be ready for yeah, yeah exactly yeah so then um the next thing i want to talk about is he has a duel with this guy named charles dickinson and he actually fights a few duels but uh this one is the most is the most uh interesting because um charles dickinson he's an expert marksman very good shooter and uh, Andrew Jackson knew that going into it. And basically, he gets in an argument with somebody over a horse race. And the argument kind of escalates. And there's some bar fights. And eventually, Charles Dickinson, he gets involved. I think it was because um, he was the son-in-law of the guy that uh, Andrew Jackson was feuding with. And so uh, he calls Andrew Jackson a coward. And Andrew Jackson says, oh, yeah, I challenge you to a duel. And he knows that this guy is a much better shot. So what he does is before he goes to the duel, he puts on like a big overcoat that makes his torso look bigger than it actually is. And then he he allows uh, Andrew uh, Charles Dickinson to shoot first. 
So Charles Dickinson shoots and he hits him in the chest near the heart, but not exactly on it. And then, uh, and, and he's still standing after getting shot. So then Charles Dickinson has to stand still and let Andrew Jackson shoot. And Andrew Jackson takes his time and he lines up his shot and then he shoots him in the heart. And uh, a few hours later, Charles Dickinson dies. But then uh, later on, what Andrew Jackson said is like, even if he had shot me in the brain, I still would have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. And then, um, OK, so he's the he's in charge of the Tennessee militia and the War of 1812 starts. Have you heard of the War of 1812? I have not. No. Mm -mm. So it's our second war that we had with the English after the War of uh, Independence. And the main reason it started is because the English were, uh, they were just ta taking sailors off of our ships and drafting them to serve in the English Navy, uh, whether they wanted to or not. They called it impressment. And eventually, you know, our government declared war on them because of that. And the English came and they, they'd actually won, they, they beat us in a lot of the battles and they actually burned uh they they took washington dc and they burned the white house the original white house really okay yeah. i did yes. not notice okay they were actually wow. winning at the beginning of the war and they were helped by different tribes of native americans because um the native americans most of them that were involved were more sympathetic to the english and actually that was also the case during the revolutionary war is uh, more Native Americans sided with the English than they did with America. And then during the Civil War, which would happen later, more Native Americans sided with the Confederacy than with the Union. So, and actually in each case, it was, it was logical for them to do so, but uh, unfortunately they picked the side that was going to lose. Yeah, and actually that's very common for an outside power, power to align themselves with a minority. Um, that's very common. That's also what happened in uh, Spain when the, the Muslims invaded. They allied themselves with the Jews for the exact same reason. So, yeah. Anyway, okay. Yeah. Continue. So, yeah, uh, yeah that, that's good. So, um, the the Creeks, the Creeks, uh, they fight. Uh, there's a group of Creek natives called uh, the Red Sticks, and uh, they're going around and doing a lot of damage. So Andrew Jackson, he has to deal with them, or he's called upon to deal with them. And from 18, he fights with them from 1813 to 1814 until they're beaten at uh, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And the, the way this battle ends is actually in a lot of uh, CQC, where Andrew Jackson's people get into this fortress and they fight with these guys in close quarters, you know, personal combat. And so that's his first victory, his big victory against these red sticks um, that were from the Creek tribe. But then there were other Creeks that were fighting, you know, that were on the side of the United States and even some that were fighting uh, for Andrew Jackson. So the next big thing is the Battle of New Orleans, um, where Andrew Jackson defeats a superior force of, uh, of English and the English, they come in by sea. And when Andrew Jackson gets to New Orleans, he just drafts all the able-bodied men. So there's like his army is kind of a, a hodgepodge of people. You've got like rich guys, poor guys, um, Native Americans, and even some uh, black Americans who were freed from slavery. And they build fortifications out of cotton bales, dirt, and logs to protect their cannons. And as the English are coming in from the sea, they, they blast them from there. And it's a great victory, which makes Andrew Jackson very popular. But this battle actually happens after the war has already been concluded because um, the war was ended with the Treaty of Ghent that was signed in 1814. But it took a while for the different, uh, for the regular, the soldiers on both sides to get the word that the war was over. So they actually had this battle after the war was over. So, um, but during this time, he gets the nickname of Old Hickory. And he's known as a war hero. 
So then uh, the next big thing that he does is um, back then Florida was still ruled by Spain and uh, the Seminoles who were natives to that, to that area would come out and uh, they would raid the United States and particularly they would raid into Georgia, which is my state. And so uh, Andrew Jackson was tasked with resolving the situation but the orders weren't all that clear, so he could interpret it kind of in his own way. And he went down there and he took over Florida. Like he beat the Seminoles and he also beat, uh, he took two forts from Spain. And then he appointed one of his officers as the, the governor of Florida, the military governor. So Florida becomes a part of the United States. And again, after that, he's like, okay, I'm done. I want to retire. And he goes back to his plantation. But in 1822, some of his friends, they, um, they nominate him for president. And they want him to run in the 1824 election. So uh, he runs. And he run the party that he runs in is called the Democratic Republican Party. So it, it shouldn't be confused with the uh, Democrats and Republicans. Okay, so... So yes, in 1820. So he, he thought he was done with everything, but then the next thing came up. He was going to retire yeah, to his he plantation. Tries, he tries to retire, and his friends, uh, they coerce him into, they nominate him to run for president. And he runs as a Democratic Republican. That's, that's the political party that uh, was actually the party of Thomas Jefferson. But they, they don't exist today. They no longer exist. So um, can, can I interrupt you for once? Were, were there more than two party, parties back then or was it just two different parties? Um, good question. I think uh, actually I think there now I feel embarrassed. I should know this, but the I think there were at least two. Um, there were like a Thomas Jefferson and the next few guys that came after him were all Democratic Republicans because Thomas Jefferson was such a popular president. Um, I think there was another party. It might have been the Whig Party, but I, I can't remember. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Not might sure be interesting to see if there was ever a party that was like big or like substantial and then just completely disappeared. Yeah, there were. That, okay. The Democratic Republicans were big okay. and substantial, and they're going to completely disappear. And also the Whig Party and um, uh, a few others. Well. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, so what happens is, uh, he runs and there's four other guys that run for president at the same time. And, uh, Andrew Jackson, he actually gets the, um, the majority of the votes. He gets the most popular votes and the greatest share of electoral votes but because he didn't cross the threshold of 133 electoral votes, they decided to redo the election and, and they redid it in the House of Representatives. So like the, if there's something wrong with the national election, it gets kicked down to the House of Representatives where um, they vote on who gets to be the president there. And they gave, even though Andrew Jackson had the most votes, they gave it to this other guy, uh, John Quincy Adams. And so Andrew Jackson is, is uh, livid about that, and so are his supporters. Um, so the Speaker of the House, uh, his name is Henry Clay, and he is the one that persuaded them to vote for um, this other guy. And then when John Quincy Adams becomes president, he rewards uh, Henry Clay. He makes him the Secretary of State. So Andrew Jackson's like, oh, uh, you know, you bribed him with this uh, post, and that's how come you won. It's not the will of the people. So in 1828, and it's the 1824 election, Andrew Jackson loses. But in 1828, he runs again, and this time he creates his new political party. So do you have any idea what that would be? The Republican Party. No. Republican okay. Party starts with Abraham Lincoln, and that comes later. <laughs> okay. This is 
Yeah, but I mean, you had like a 50% chance. But this <laughs> yeah, okay. Is the, Democrat. <laughs> the Democrat, Democrat Party. Okay, yeah. all right. He actually started the Democrat Party. So um, the Democratic Party was started by a lawyer. Hmm. It started by, uh, yeah, Andrew Jackson. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, act, of course, actually, they're trying, today, they're trying to distance themselves from him, but um, that's easier said than done. So, uh, during this election, though, it was a very vicious election, and um, the the ruling party, the Democratic Republicans, and uh, also the media, they kind of pile on to Andrew Jackson and smear him in all sorts of ways. And like one thing they do is they start calling him Andrew Jackass in the newspapers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And, All right. They draw uh, like a picture of a donkey with his head on it, like eating grass. Ah. And and, and then um, Andrew Jackson says, "Okay, fine, I'm a jackass," and the donkey ends up becoming the mascot of his party. Really, that's so interesting. Cool. Yeah, they, they yeah. still they still use it today. Yeah, because it's uh, the donkeys, right? And then for the Republicans, it's the the rhinos. Or... No, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an elephant. Rhino it's an elephant. Is, okay, sorry. Rhino yeah. is like an insult for a Republican who doesn't uh, doesn't really do what they say they're going to do. But um, okay, all right. that, that'll come later. But yeah. so he. So, but then also they go. They um, they attack his wife, uh, Rachel, and they say that oh, she's she's fat and obese and she was overweight. And they also say she's an adulteress and you don't want someone like this in the white house. And she finds out about it. And she says, you know, I don't want to be in the white house. So Andrew Jackson, he wins the election, but his wife dies of a heart attack after that. And he blames it on like the media and on his, um, the opposing party that the that they caused his wife to die from stress that's what he thinks but it actually poisons her <laughs> no <laughs> no. Uh, no i'm yeah. kidding yeah. yeah okay so um and andrew jackson he's very popular with like the regular people uh he he markets himself as like the the common the the representative of the common man and so when he wins he invite he opens the white house he invites like the citizens to the inauguration ceremony and all sorts of people come in like frontiersmen and uh, farmers you know small farmers all these kind of people that normally wouldn't ever have the chance to go in and they serve food and do drinks and these people they uh, get drunk and rowdy and they spill alcohol everywhere and ice cream all over the floor of the white house and they break furniture and dishes so the um Andrew Jackson's opponents they call him king they call him king mob because okay. they say that they see it as like a barbarian invasion well, it's like a populist right it's kind of like uh, he's yeah got the he, popular vote and it's got like the yeah okay. yeah he was a, a populist um and actually he was against uh, like there was okay so you probably know that uh whenever we have an election the new president can replace uh, people in the executive branch, like the the guys that are in charge of different departments underneath him. Mm -hmm. But before Andrew Jackson, those people were not replaced. Like the, the president had the option to replace, but they just kept these people. So Andrew Jackson was, um, he was concerned about these unelected bureaucrats who had served through multiple presidencies. So once he got elected, he cleaned those people out. And he said, you know, the government is corrupt and um, there's too much influence in there from unelected, unelected uh, appointments. And uh, he wanted to put his own people. So he did. And that's yeah. what started the tradition of presidents making new appointments. But I don't think that anybody ever made as many new appointments as Andrew Jackson. Hmm. And they they called it the spoil system where the new president gets to make their own appointments. Uh, yeah, I see how that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, just because the other presidents didn't use the power, it doesn't mean they didn't have the power. And another thing that he does in the same vein is he starts to veto. He uses the veto like uh, more generously than previous presidents who they would only veto a bill 
if they thought it was unconstitutional. But uh, he would veto a bill if he didn't like it, if he thought it was against his uh, policies. Okay. And, yeah, because yeah, he figured, um, you know, that, well, actually, it's true. Uh, he got more votes than anybody else. So he was, he had a lot more uh, backing behind his agenda than anybody else in politics did in terms of raw numbers. Yeah, I think the, the replacing the heads of departments is probably a smart thing to do, but then... Like the people that are in the department, they probably stay, right? Or are they, are they also replaced? That's they can be replaced as well. Mm. Um, and I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I think he actually did a deep cleaning and expunged a lot of people. Um, usually like what happens with presidents now is they'll replace like the department heads and then the department heads can decide what they want to do with the lesser people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So then the other thing he did is, I mean, I suspect he probably really got rid of a lot of them um, because he was constantly uh, attacked by the, the people. They said that he was, um, you know, rep acting like a king and a dictator and that uh, the people that follow him are barbarians, you know, yeah. unwashed so masses. He had a lot of enemies. So, to, yeah. He yeah, because he campaigned against the, um, the bureaucracy. Yeah. And also, one of the one of the most famous things that he did was he killed. Um, he got rid of the uh, Second Bank of the United States, which was which was kind of like today what we have is the Federal Reserve, mm, and it was, uh, the, like a national bank. Yeah, yeah, it was a bank, um, but it's a private company. It wasn't an actual branch of the government, and the bank had like many different shareholders. And it was actually printing paper money for the United States. And the federal, the federal money that the government had was stored in this bank. But then the bank could also print more money so it could control the value of currency. And it also held debt for the government. And Andrew Jackson, he thought that this was, um, you know, a, a bunch of wealthy elites trying to hijack the, the country for their own purposes. And he's, and, and so his opponents, the, the bank was going to expire in 1836 and it had to be renewed, but they decided to bring it up earlier for renewal in Congress because they thought that uh, they wanted to make it a political issue for the next election. And they thought there's no way that uh, Andrew Jackson will, like if we put it up for renewal, he'll have to, renew it otherwise the economy will be disrupted but he actually vetoes the recharter and then he pulls all of the the federal money out of the bank so he says um let's see he, he says it's uh the 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 prostration of our government to the advancement of the few at the expense of the many that's what he said about the the bank and was he referring to uh the printing of the money part was that the reason why he was so opposed to this this institution or yeah i think um he wasn't fond of fiat currency because mm. uh the next thing he does is like in uh, after he closes the bank um and the bank completely runs dry in in 18 like he severs the relationship of it uh, between the bank and the government in 1832 and the bank closes in 1836 for good um, and in 1835, he pays off all the federal debt so that our government has no debt after. Wow. He's, yeah. And then he requires that gold and silver be used to purchase federal lands. So he was he was all about, um, you know, fixed he value. Was, he was like a early version of Ron Paul. That's, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty much, except he was very much against secession, which I'll which is actually like, um, I'm going to mention that too. But he, um, yeah, so he, but the thing about like a central bank like that is when you have fiat money that's not tied to a hard asset, like the bank can make more of it and yeah. then the value of the money goes down. So that's it's a very current it's a very current topic actually because you get you do have taxation through inflation so you just print more money and then the money loses value and then all the regular people that don't own any like land or property or uh, you know like 
businesses they just have some money maybe stored in a bank somewhere maybe just under their mattress and rather than paying like a five percent tax on their income it just loses five percent value and the government is spending that extra money that way yeah so it's you just lose a, yeah yeah your purchasing power goes down and uh purchasing power for the regular person goes down because the banks you know they receive not just the central bank, but like the, the lesser banks, the local banks that cooperate with the central bank, they receive um, money from the central bank. So yeah. when the bank pumps more money, it goes to the other banks. Yeah, they get it for free right. and then they charge interest on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And if you're like an old person who's worked your whole life and now you're too old to work, well, now your retirement's not as worth as much. Yeah. So uh, this guy was a very interesting, uh, interesting character and I had never heard of him. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then actually what happens, and also in 1835, uh, there's this guy named Richard Lawrence that tries to kill Andrew Jackson. And this guy was from England, and he caught, Richard, uh, he caught uh, the president as he was leaving some ceremony, and he fired on him at point-blank range with a pistol, but the gun misfired. And then he took out a second pistol that was inside his coat, and that one also misfired. So Andrew Jackson... Uh, beats this guy with his cane and uh, he almost kills him but the guys that are with Andrew Jackson they kind of pull him apart and when they interrogate this Lawrence guy he he just says all kinds of nonsense that's like oh I used to work for the king of England and and uh, Andrew Jackson ruined my life like all sorts of incoherent stuff and the king of England that he used to work for was like um, alive in the 1600s or something like that so they, because his statements are so incoherent, they just dismiss him as a lunatic and they commit him to a, a sanitarium. He's not even executed for this. Mm. So I, yeah. I, you know, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Convenient. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and Andrew Jackson is the first uh, president who is attempted, like there's an attempted assassination. And John F. Kennedy you know, he was successfully assassinated. And at the time that he was assassinated, he was working on abolishing the Federal Reserve. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then okay. the, next, the next thing is um, that I have to mention is the nullification crisis of uh, 18, eight, like the dates that I have is 1828 to 1832 for the duration of this. And there was this tariff, this bill called that um, Southerners didn't like. It was called the Tariff of Abominations. And the, it was actually Andrew Jackson's predecessor who signed it. And what it did is it put uh, high, ridic like, high tariffs on goods, manufactured goods that were coming in from England to the United States. And it was designed to um, help the northern states where they had the factories and produced manufactured goods of their own. And they wanted to be able to sell them to the Southerners and also just to sell, I guess, to sell them abroad as well. But they wanted to force, they wanted to make sure that they couldn't be undersold by England. Mm -hmm. And so the Southerners that were like rich uh, plantation holders, maybe all the Southerners, but they were really annoyed with it because it was going to drive up their costs. Because now they have to pay like whatever the northerners want for the manufactured goods. And so they called it the Tariff of Abominations. And uh, there's this guy, his name is John C. Calhoun, who is actually Andrew Jackson's vice president. And he, um, he actually campaigned against this uh, tariff. And then eventually he left, he resigned as vice president and was uh, appointed as a uh, senator from South Carolina. And he tried to, um, at first, they said, we're not going to enforce the tariff in South Carolina. Like, uh, we are not going to gather this tariff. You know, the English, they can come here and sell, and we're, we're going to pay what we want to pay. And Andrew Jackson was like, um, he said, <clears throat> he said, no, you have to obey the law just like everybody else. So it got more tense to the point where they started talking about secession, leaving the country. And John C. Calhoun was the main leader in this talk. 
And this is where Andrew Jackson, he says, um, if you secede from my nation, I will secede your head from the rest of your body. And he wanted to, um, so he did two things. One is he threatens to use force against South Carolina to send the army down there. Um, but also he negotiates with Congress to have them lower the tariffs. So Congress lowers the tariffs. Not They don't do away with it completely, but they lowered enough that the South Carolinans kind of back down and, and like, okay, we'll cooperate. And then um, the last thing that I, I have to mention with Andrew Jackson is the, uh, the Indian Removal Act. Um, and I've, of course, uh, it's called the Indian Removal Act, but really by that they mean Native Americans, not actual real Indians. So um, the, the Indian Removal Act was passed in 526-1830, and it was designed to remove or assimilate um, the Native Americans that were, that were still living in uh, United States territory. There were these, these groups called the five, they were called the five civilized tribes because um, they had become sedentary and formed themselves into houses and cities. And they also adopted um, uh, a written language, a written text for their language. So they were, they basically met all the requirements of civilization, mm -hmm. unlike most of the other Amerindians who, who didn't. Um, and they were the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, Creek, and Seminoles. Seminoles are from Florida, Cherokees are from Georgia. And uh, <clears throat> the, the Indian Removal Act said that they either have to accept um, the sovereignty of the United States and just become citizens, or they have to move west of the Mississippi. Like the government will give them land west of the Mississippi in exchange for their, for their land that they have now. And what ends up happening is with these different tribes, smaller groups of guys that would go to the United States government and cut a deal to remove their tribe to the West. Mm -hmm. um, but they, but then they didn't necessarily speak for the majority of the tribe. So these, most of the people in the tribe, they didn't want to move, but the, but then the government would said, well, yeah, well, we got this treaty from, from these representatives. Oh, well, they don't represent us. Oh, well, too bad. We didn't know that. So, Military goes in and forces a lot of these people to leave. And uh, the Cherokees are probably the most famous because uh, they were deported during the winter. And it was called the Trail of Tears because so many of them died along the way. It was a forceful march to the West. And, the, and this gets blamed on Andrew Jackson, but actually it happened after he was gone. Um, the Trail of Tears happened when his predecessor... Uh, not predecessor, sorry, successor took over, uh, Van Buren, <clears throat> who was also a Democrat. Um, and he, but, but the legislation that laid the groundwork for it was passed by Andrew Jackson. So that's how he would share in the blame. Yeah. And then uh, once he was done being president, um, somebody asked him, like, uh, do you have any regrets? And he says, uh, you know, he says that I, I didn't shoot Henry Clay and I didn't hang John C. Calhoun. And when he's old and he's on his deathbed, uh, his, one, of his, one of the last things he said was, I killed the bank. So that was what, I guess, what he considered to be his greatest achievement was shutting mm. down uh, the bank. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah. And fun fact, the bullet that uh, got shot into his chest during that du duel with Charles Dickinson was never removed. It was too close to his heart, and it would cause him pain for the rest of his life, and every once in a while he would uh, cough up blood from it. And actually, um, I read that there was another bullet lodged in his body as well from, from some other encounter that couldn't be removed, but I wasn't able to find uh, what encounter that was. Um, so yeah, he dies and he actually doesn't have any kids. He doesn't have any biological descendants. He had a few, there were actually a few Native American children that he adopted when, 
you know, after battles. And none of them survived to adulthood. They all died as either children or teenagers. So um, his line pretty much ended entirely. But uh, the Democrat Party, of course, is still around today. And they still use his, um, his donkey. Of course, they don't really have anything in common with him in terms of policy anymore. Other than they pretty much just have the name and the logo. That's about it. And yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much everything that I had. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I never heard about this guy. I knew about the Trail of Tears. I uh, visited like I don't know where it was. I did a East Coast trip at one point in time, and there was a, a Cherokee tribe kind of like reenactment, like <laughs> kind of like living the way that they used to live, and then kind of explaining what the um, and and they also talked about this as well. Um, but yeah, the yeah, Green I, Corn it, Festival. Yeah, I, I remember what their their places look like, and it looked quite civilized, actually, uh, quite advanced. So, um, yeah, they they actually yeah. fully adopted civilization, um, you know, and they and they have their own written text. They didn't before before Europeans came. They didn't have anything, but I think it was actually a a missionary that helped them adopt a text. And actually, in terms of the world as a whole. Uh, very few people invented their own written text. Most people that have a written text got it from somebody else. So I'm, my thinking is that um, had the new world been connected with the old world, the level of civilization and development would have been higher here because of you know the diffusion of in, of innovations and written text. But you know even the most advanced uh, cultures in this part of the world as far as indigenous cultures go would actually be like those people in Mexico the Aztecs and the Mayas and the well the Incas are in Peru but um, and those guys had all of the requirements of civilization they even had astronomy and stoneworking but for some reason it never occurred to any of them to um, make a wheel or to make a metal tool they made they worked like gold into statues and things, but they never made a, they never worked iron or bronze. Hmm. Yeah. But had they, had they been connected with the old world, they then they would have adopted it for sure. Yeah. And yeah. But me. now a lot of uh, the, like the plains people with, they pretty much preferred like the, um, the, uh, the nomadic lifestyle. So I doubt they would have ever willingly adopted civilization, even though they did adopt guns they still didn't care to uh, live in cities or have a written language. And they kind of resisted until the bitter end, those guys. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a sad story, The Trail of Tears. Uh, I was just reading up uh, on it as you were talking. Estimated 2,000 to 8,000 people died, which is uh, a lot. But then again, like, you know, like it's horrible. But if you compare it to like the Armenian uh, genocide, for example, when people were marched into uh, the deserts of uh of uh africa um the numbers were way higher but anyway there's no no sense to compare those things but it's still interesting to know anyway well the trail the trail of tears wasn't intended to be um a genocide it was just intended yeah. and to uh, what the turks did with the uh, armenians definitely was and the greeks yeah so well, i think the the yeah, it's worse, um, especially in terms of numbers. But I think the well, bad... they were sent to this desert where there was like no food. They weren't sent to the other side of the Mississippi. So, yeah, they were just... the Armenians. They were like uh, sent to concentration camps in the heart of the Syrian desert. Then they also crucify a lot of the women naked in the Armenian genocide. I've yeah, they would also bayonet like uh, pregnant women and all kinds of stuff. So. Yeah, throw the babies in the air and then catch them with the baby net, stuff like that. So, well, anyway, yeah, yeah awesome. interesting. Uh, but we're, I feel like we're going too far off topic. So, but yeah, no, it's an interesting guy, interesting, uh, interesting, uh, interesting story for sure. Yeah, yeah, actually, I think that Andrew Jackson, um, he's considered to be very controversial. Um, and you know, the, the thing about it is slavery. A, Unfortunately, quite a few of the early presidents had slaves, and um, you know I could never agree with that, and I think it's unfortunate 
that we had slavery in the United States, especially given that it's against our founding principles, like it's against the founding philosophy. But he did sustain the life of the United States, like, um, you know, getting rid of the central bank, driving out uh, Spain from Florida and um, paying off the debt. I mean, those things that he did, uh, they they probably gave they made the country stronger. And without him, you know, if, if it had been more of the, the same kind of guys that came before, uh, our country might not to still be here today. Or if it is, it might not have been a world power. It would have been a split, potentially. Yeah. No, it's interesting. And, you know, like, you know, everything has to be black and white. Like, some things just aren't black and white. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. I don't think John Quincy Adams would have been able to stop uh, South Carolina from seceding. Now, now that you mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just talking about, like, like... You know, like, yeah, would I have appreciate? Would do I look at this guy like, oh, what a role model? It's like, no, yeah, he owned slaves, but uh, he's still an interesting guy, and he played an important part in your history. Um, so yeah, interesting owned, to learn more about him. Yeah. He owned slaves, and he slept with a woman who was married to somebody else while she was married, and he also was a hothead and got into yeah. bar fights and duels and. Uh, yeah, man, he his, shot a guy in the heart using some trick and, you know, over what? Some kind of insult. <laughs> an insult. Well, yeah. after the bar fight, it was an insult and then a bar fight and then a duel. And then, oh, and then another yeah. insult and then a duel. And yeah, and then, and then he tricked the guy. So he's like, he wasn't even fighting fair either. Like, you know, anyway. But the guy well, was a lawyer, right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Prosecutor. So, okay. It wasn't yeah. going to be a fair fight, though, because the other guy was a, was a, was a, trained marksman and andrew jackson wasn't yeah also i no, heard it, um he only weighed 160 pounds too and he was a tall dude he's a scrawny dude he was a so he was made a tough himself dude. look all big yeah and, although the, yeah. the freaks they called him they gave him a name it was something like old strong man after his fighting with them <laughs> the old strong man yeah Fighting duels. Those were the dueling days. Yeah, they I were in I fashion was... for at the time, right? They were a big thing. Uh, Actually, you know. his duel with uh, yeah, they there were duels. Some politicians, other politicians, actually died in duels. I think was duels... that a, was that a French thing? Duels? Did didn't those come out of France? The whole dueling thing with your second dent and everything. We should look I... into that. Should. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I think uh, dueling is probably older than than that. You know, I know the, yeah, Japanese... the whole thing with the guns and you walk away and then you turn around. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know either. Yeah. It I'll, may I'll look in those... if, if if you want to put if you're going for looking for the pictures for this video, and you find something, maybe you should put that in there because I would be interested to find. Oh, I found place. quite. A, I found a couple pictures of him uh, dueling. I'll nice. put some in. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, I don't know. I think dueling is probably one of those things that was inevitably going to develop, regardless. I think um, it's something that probably existed in most of the world. I could be wrong. Kind of like slavery. You know, slavery existed in most of the world, and and bar fights also exist in most of the world wherever there's alcohol and still exist today. So yeah, yeah but I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, I don't think I would live very long back then if I was in that kind of society. Because you're you know, a hothead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a hothead. And a poor shot. No. <laughs> but, I, but you can even if you're not a hothead, you can still be killed by one, right? Like. Yeah. And yeah, oh, you gotta be. You gotta be working your diplomacy skills. Probably. Yeah, and Andrew yeah. Jackson, he didn't have diplomacy skills for sure. He had. He. Um, it was also he also used vulgar language and. Uh, he spelt words however he pleased. Oh, so yeah, and like his his fights and his duels, they were preceded by insults and cursing. So it's kind of he, a he misspelled the words whichever way he wanted. Yeah, oh. he said it's a a poor man who only knows one way to spell a word. So he okay. would when he was writing, he would spell things however he, he just wanted. he just didn't know better, or he just refused to uh, to spell the right way. Look, I I'm. Think... A... 
It, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to overlook the owning slaves part, but uh, <laughs> the spelling. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Here. Oh, yeah. I got to yeah. say, the guy that tried to shoot him, um, the guy that tried to shoot him, they, after they took this guy down, both, you know, both his guns misfired. They tested the guns afterwards and found there was nothing wrong. And every time they would pull the trigger, the guns would shoot. So there were some people that were thinking, you know, maybe God just wanted this guy to survive. And, you know, I, I kind of think maybe that's true, even though he was a bad, you know, kind of a bad character in terms of his personal life. And he was kind of a godless guy. He did, you know, strengthen the life of the country in terms of his policy. But, I mean, he took a bullet to the chest and survived. He said, take your turn first and stood there to take a bullet. And he still survived. And then this guy's guns, there was nothing wrong with the guns, but one misfired and then the other misfired. But mm. it, I, I could believe it, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe God just wanted him to, to live so he could do whatever he was supposed to do, even though he did that, you know, he didn't really care about God necessarily. He was more about uh, more about. I also wonder how he sounded and when did the southern accent start? Yeah, I, I was actually uh, looking him up online, and it looks like his uh, parents came from Northern Ireland. Yeah. So he's a first generation. Does that make you a first generation American or a second generation? Yeah, he was a first generation first American. First generation, yeah. And, and I actually traveled through the Appalachian air, um, region where you have a lot of Irish people there um, that were dirt poor, right? I think at the time. but And then they settled in this area. So yeah, a lot yeah, of people so I imagine poor back then, um, yeah. especially in the south and in the west, you know. And but actually, that was preferable because, like in Europe, even I. Think well, I mean, uh, in Ireland, people were dying from uh, hunger on a massive scale, right? So. Yeah. But you know, in Ireland, you couldn't own land. in In most countries in Europe, you couldn't own land because of the land, like landlords. Uh, As a Catholic, but I'm guessing this guy was probably uh, not a Catholic, right? Well, I mean, like in most most people in, in Europe were renters back then, yeah, and in England too, because the uh, the landlords owned most of the land. So that's one of the reasons why so many people came to the United States when when most of back when most of our immigration used to come from Europe was because uh, they wanted land, even if it was living in a dirt hut. Like when um, when we colonized the Great Plains region, um, there were no trees out there, and our government was like giving um, people land. Like you could you could come from Europe, and the government would give you land, provided that you settle and develop it. You didn't have to pay for it. So a lot of people, you know, they chose that because they could be independent, even though it was dangerous and difficult. You know, and a lot of people did get slaughtered by Native Americans too in the process. And like the people that colonized the Great Plains, which today is where most of our food comes from, they they lived in dirt houses. Like they would cut the, the sod and the grass and stack it up into a hut. So you'd be sleeping in there in this dirt house and maybe the snakes and insects fall on you while you're sleeping. Mm. And, they, and there's just enough wood to make like a door for your dirt house. Yeah. But, but yeah, that's... um. You know, it's 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 interesting, and and of course back then they had a lot more testosterone than we do today. Because like I think about all this stuff, and and I'm like, man, I I don't want to live without a a bathroom and and all this kind of stuff. But um, at the same time, if you cannot own land, then you know that's that's not a good thing either because you can't. It's hard to build up generational wealth and pass it on to your children. It's also hard to be truly independent because maybe you say something that the landlord doesn't like or or the government doesn't like and next thing you know you're homeless and uh, what about all the stuff that you had in your house well now you got no place to put it so. yeah and you know like uh the mortality rate was quite high but i'm guessing people were also living more intense life lives back then I'm they're thinking. also having a lot more kids like they're I having think, more yeah. kids, but the mortality rate was also much higher among kids. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's yeah why and by the way, kids. the the Irish famine, the first one of seventy forty to seventy forty one, killed off thirteen percent to twenty percent of the population. 
Um, so there's a good chance that his parents uh, fled Ireland because of that, or around that time, because he was yeah. born in 1767. Yeah. I should have looked that up. I didn't. I I read that they were um, immigrants, and also that his father died cutting down a tree, or he died in a lumbering accident. Yeah. And, and so Timber never... and. <laughs> Oh, no, shit. I told you to stand on the <laughs> other side of the tree. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he was drinking, you know, because he's from Ireland. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's always been a lot of drinking, especially in the South. And yeah, well, I think especially in hard times, uh, people would drink a lot, you know, because there is a lot of trauma. People are dealing with a lot of uh, hardships, you know, like, you know, kids were dying, you know parents yeah. were dying and you wouldn't have food there were terrible diseases and oh you were living in this uh, hut and insects were falling on you <laughs> <laughs> as you're trying to sleep yeah you know so there was a lot more alcoholism back then but uh yeah yeah, yeah different times you know and um i think the next i think it, it would have been nice if uh instead of fighting the world wars and then the other nonsense wars, we could have just put all that effort and energy into colonizing space. And, uh, but you know, that's a video I probably would do on my personal channel about that, about ways that that could be done. Yeah. Um, check out uh, Ivor's channel. He's got a, like an eclectic, uh, bevy of uh, different topics, including space, uh, sci-fi, and Tolkien. Some really good uh, good videos on there. Maybe you can put that in the description as well. It's all pretty esoteric stuff. Um, yeah. But anyway, yep. I, think, uh, I think this video is long enough. I think I'll stop. So do you have anything you want to add? No. Uh, thank you for this. I think I learned something new today. Never knew about this guy. And... Uh, this guy actually played a big role in, in your government. I heard about all the, the George Washingtons and the, the Benjamin Franklins. Never about Andrew Jackson. So thanks for that. And uh, other than that, got nothing to share, uh, except maybe uh, if you can share this video, we appreciate it. Um, we're on BitChute, YouTube, and on podcasts. Um, we're doing this uh, just for the fun of it, and we're hoping to build up a little bit of a community. So if you have any feedback, any topics you want to share with us, uh, give us a like. We appreciate it. Share it with a friend. We appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for listening. Yeah. Hey, Anything you want to add to that, Ivor, or want to go ahead and close it off? No, no, that's that's sufficient. <laughs> okay. uh, let's go ahead and close. I will say, though, that um, I did get a request from somebody. So we'll be getting ah, to that, uh, you know, as soon as I get the chance. Nice, nice, good. All right, thanks, guys. See, yeah. see you next uh, next week.